Allied generals James Stanhope and Guido von Stauffenberg have achieved a victory that allowed the Grand Alliance to finally break out of their strongholds in Catalonia. For the first time in several years, the Loyalists to King Philip V have been routed in a major battle. The victory boosted the Allies' confidence in continuing the war in Iberia. The Battle of Almenar, however, will need a decisive follow-up in order to land the Allies in Madrid, for Philip V planned to make a stand. The Bourbon Spanish army evacuated Catalonia to the city of Saragossa. Here, Philip V received reinforcements from Alexandre de Maitre, the Marquis de Baye, a Frenchman in Spanish service who would also lead the army in eastern Spain. De Baye already carried a crushing victory under his belt, so there was no doubt of his abilities to his own men and his king. Upon his arrival on the 9th of August, he took command of 26,000 men and 20 cannon. The same day, he would position his army between the Ebro River and Montero outside of Saragossa. De Baye's opponent, Field Marshal Guido von Stachenberg, wasted no time in continuing to pursue the Spanish army. He also received reinforcements, boosting his army close to 30,000 men with an unknown number of cannon. With him was the aggressive James Stanhope, who boldly led the Allied cavalry charge at Almenar. Despite their differences in leading, both men had proven to work very well with one another. The Portuguese Count of Atalaya would be commanding the Catalonian and Habsburg Spanish forces of Archduke Charles VI. Debai knew he would need to put distance between him and the Allied army, so he deployed some of his best cavalry to check any Allied reconnaissance. This came to a head on the 15th of August. The short distance Stachenberg was following became realized when Spanish cavalry and Allied cavalry found each other at the small village of Penalva. The Spanish possessed a cavalry brigade consisting of the Ordenes Viejo, Rosian Viejo, Real Asturias, and Pozo Blanco cavalry regiments, along with the Reales Guardias Valonas, or Royal Wyoming Guards. The Allied regiments are thought to have been the Drimborn, Schlippenbach, Matha, Pepper, and Rochefort's Dragoon regiments, along with the Palatinate, Spee, Carassier. There are no existing maps of the engagement, but it is known that the area was rather mountainous. Early in the morning, Spanish and Allied cavalry encountered each other on reconnaissance, and took both of each other by surprise. The Spanish, playing on the route from Almenar, gave the Allies a false sense of confidence. The first group at first retreated and lured the Allied cavalry into the remaining Spanish reinforcements, which ambushed the advancing Dutchmen. After some fighting, it was now time for the Allied cavalry to retreat back to their remaining men. The Spaniards halted upon seeing the second group of cavalry and regrouped. The routers rallied, and with their reinforcements, charged the Spaniards. Pistols, sabers, and carbines fired sporadically from each side. The fighting grew rather furiously intense for what was essentially a rearguard action. Eventually, the Allied cavalry broke and routed to a better position, where the Pepper and Rochefort's dragoons finally arrived. The arrival of the additional cavalry convinced the Spaniards to withdraw, and so they did to Saragossa. Having achieved their objective of delaying Allied forces from catching up to Devi's army to the next day. Earlier during the night of August 19th, both armies deployed on two ridge lines facing each other. The Bubons deployed in the conventional style, with the infantry in the center, led by the Marquis de Baye. He was flanked by cavalry on his right, led by Lieutenant General José Aqua, and on the left by General José de Armandariz. More troops were placed in Saragossa directly away from the battle. These would later be some of few to escape intact. The Allied troops arrived late that night and had no time to form up opposite of the Spaniards, so they too mimicked the conventional formation of the Bourbons. Stachenberg placed his British, Austrian, and Dutch troops mostly on his left flank. They, though mostly the left-wing Allied cavalry, would be led by Lieutenant General James Stanhope. Stauffenberg commanded his center with those of the infantry, 
and the Portuguese Count Atalaya commanded the mostly Catalan and Portuguese troops on the Allied right. The kings of both sides would be present, with their armies, the next day. Philip V for the Bourbons, and Archduke Charles VI for his Aragonese and Catalonian troops. The next morning, at 8 a.m. on the 20th, as Philip V walked through the ranks of his infantry to inspect them, the guns of both armies roared, sending lead through the peaceful morning air and crashing around and in both camps. The bombardment lasted for four long hours, shaking the confidence of troops on both sides. Though the Spanish suffered heavier losses from the bombardment, it is not clear which side fired first, but it is likely that the Spaniards rushed to their cannon after refusing the first blast. However, neither side suffered truly heavy losses. At Saragotha, the Allies had brought with them 24,000 men, compared to the Spanish, who had 20,000, with most of the numerical superiority being tied to the Allied infantry. Dubai anticipated that Stachenberg would try to make use of this advantage in numbers, so he ordered General Aqua to deploy his first and second lines of cavalry on his right flank under Brigade Generals Amazaga and Mahoney. Amazaga having had experience in the Battle of Alminar. Amazaga then received orders to attack immediately. His men quickly put themselves into a charge and ran and hacked their way to the Allied cavalry under their left. Despite having the numerical advantage, the Allied cavalry would be forced to fall back by the unexpected charge. Stanhope, seeing that he could not stop the Spaniards, fell back upon British infantry posted behind him. The British volleys managed to check the Spanish horsemen for a moment. However, they quickly reorganized and charged once more. As the British infantry quickly fell back, Portuguese cavalry suddenly sprung out into the Spaniards' view. Surprised, Amazaga and Mahone divided their attack into two prongs. The largest one attacked the remaining Allied cavalry, and the smaller second prong would meet the Portuguese. Despite this making Amazaga's cavalry even more outnumbered than before, they still managed to slowly push back Stanhope's cavalry. The Portuguese, sent to meet the rest, were decisively routed despite all odds. The second Spanish prong would pursue the Portuguese all the way to the Allied baggage train. It is here that the absolutely ferocious attack ran out of steam and degenerated into a stalemate. Stanhope then improvised the defense of the baggage train and brought more infantry to aid his beaten cavalrymen, hoping to surround the Iberians. About ten squadrons of the left-wing Spanish cavalry came to aid and reinforce the Spanish right-wing cavalry. The Spanish left had been an inactive area of the battlefield so far, so no immediate danger was thought to become reality. Diversion of troops from the Spanish left would prove disastrous in the very near future but it was too little, too late in general, as the charge devolved into a swirling melee. Stanhope continued to do what he could to hold, and so he did, turning the battle into a stalemate. From the center, Stahamberg saw Stanhope struggle on the Allied left, and began advancing his main center infantry lines to engage the Spanish. When both sides met below, some of the first Spanish infantry to arrive were actually specifically Walloon regiments. Walloons typically came from southeastern Belgium, the region named Wallonia. They were always common in the Spanish army and were typically brigaded together. Normally, they would prove to be very good troops. But here, the situation was different. The Walloons were far from content from being sent far away from their homes in Belgium. They were even more discontented by the way the campaign has so far been progressing. Many took the opportunity to desert. The mass desertion turned to a rout once Allied fire poured into their fleeting ranks. Saragotha would be the most humiliating time for Wallon troops of the Spanish army. The rout carried several Spanish battalions with them, leaving a massive hole in the Bourbon line. Stahenberg eagerly took advantage of this sudden opportunity. Allied infantry poured into the gap and outflanked both sides of the hole that had exposed, even into the second line. The Catalans were especially eager to jump into the fray against the mostly Castilians. It wasn't before long that absolutely murderous Allied volleys would send the Bourbon infantry running. Soon enough, the entire Spanish infantry dissolved into a rout. Dubai, trying to quickly react, ordered a retreat to save what he could. 
However, most of his right-wing cavalry were too far into the Allied left that they would just eventually be surrounded and destroyed. Only his reinforcing cavalry on that flank could leave in an orderly manner. He wanted all cavalry from his own left flank to save his routing infantry, but the sight of Allied cavalry opposite of them could only keep them pinned down. Neither did they have enough men to support them after detaching certain regiments. They too withdrew, and the Spanish line bent. For the Bourbon army of Philip V, the battle had been far more disastrous than the previous battle at Almenar could ever have been. Dubai's army suffered roughly 5,000 to 6,000 men killed or wounded, and another 7,000 taken prisoner, close to 13,000 casualties in all out of just 20,000. All 20 Spanish cannon fell into Stauffenberg's hands, along with many standards and colors, all for an allied cost of 1,500 to 2,000 casualties. It would be until late November that the Bulwan army would need to hold out and recover. Charles entered the city of Saragossa the next day on the 21st of August to an indifferent yet unhostile population. From here, he and Stauffenberg would pursue Philip V all the way to Madrid, which Philip abandoned on the 9th of September and regrouped in the fortress of Aradolid. But when Charles left Saragossa for Madrid, hopes for a decisive end to the war dithered. His army met deadly ambushes by Spanish guerrillas and militias on the road to Madrid. Because of these relentless ambushes and tenacity of the guerrillas, enthusiasm from the Allied troops for the invasion began to dwindle. By the time Charles and Stauffenberg entered Madrid, the city was nearly abandoned. Upon his arrival, Charles declared, This city is a desert! The few citizens left were uncooperated to his forces or outright hostile. Charles and Stauffenberg also needed reinforcements to hold the supply lines open and to replenish the losses taken by Spanish militias and guerrillas along the way. 17 regiments of cavalry and 16 battalions of infantry from the Portuguese field army would be sent prematurely. But the problem of quality and availability of horses in the Portuguese army once again reaped its ugly head for the first time since the beginning of the war in Iberia in 1702. This would also leave Portugal wide open to attack from the Bourbons, but the inactiveness of the theater since 1709 kept fears at bay for the moment. The Allies would also receive six British battalions from Portugal as additional reinforcements. However, the situation could only get worse. Count Villa Verde of the Portuguese army found himself bogged down at the city of Almaraf by token Spanish forces at the city. The Spanish also received new leadership, the capable French veterans, Duke of Vendôme and the Duke of Noailles. They took control of the Spanish army September and immediately got to work. Political pressure from Allied High Command would force the Allies to move, but only in limited attacks across the border. Villa Verde's men did not have the heart for a long campaign. Vendôme would spend the next two months keeping the Allies at bay, planning an offensive, and rebuilding the Spanish army. All Charles could do was scrounge up what he already had and hope to hold Madrid. He was becoming almost completely surrounded by hostile guerrillas, however, and time would force his hand. Despite their major victory at the Battle of Saragossa, the campaign in Spain quickly changed and seemed bleaker than ever. A repeat of 1707 became the Grand Alliance's greatest fear, and now it seemed like it would come true.